I hope your Bibles are turned to Matthew chapter 5 and you have your answers to the questions ready to share with us. And I'll just say this, if you have an answer or something that you would like to share with us on the second part of question number one, which is why did Jesus have to even deal with his relationship to the law? Why was that important for him to deal with? You can raise your hands. We'll get a microphone to you. Do we have microphone runners? Anybody have a microphone? All right. All right. We've got at least one with a microphone. Before we start, let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. God, we are amazed by you. We're amazed by your son. We are just so grateful for your law, and we're so grateful for your mercy. And we understand that your law is merciful to us. It te teaches us how to live a life that is fulfilling here, and most importantly, a life that will please you so that we can be shown mercy at the end. We just love you so much. We love your word. We thank you for allowing us to be together studying it. And we pray that you'll be with our hearts as we open up your word today. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I hope all of you are taking us up on the challenge to at least read through or listen to the Sermon on the Mount every week. So if all the whole three chapters, either read it or you have a dramatized version of the Bible, listen to that. Or if you don't have a dramatized version, a regular version, or some of the links I gave you, have it in there so you can just turn and hit one of those links and be able to watch the Sermon on the Mount being delivered by Jenna's uncle, actually, who memorized it in one of our challenges that we had years ago. So let's go ahead and read the text, Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. We'll start with that. Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20 says this, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's where we're going to start with our first question, the second part of that. Why did Jesus need to even address this point of his relationship to the law? Why was that so important? Raise your hand if you have a comment on that. I mean, this is, I mean, it's only, like we said, 13, 14 minute sermon. So you got to figure everything he says is important, right? He's not leaving any, he's not saying anything by accident. So why is it so important? that Jesus is addressing this particular issue. All right. You have to talk into the microphone, please. Uh, well, uh, one of many, and I won't take them all, but identification. Identification of the Christ. Okay. The law identifies who the Christ is. All right. So who he is. Yeah, the law identifies who the Christ is. So everybody, so everybody would know that he is the Christ. We have Debbie up here. Um, just simply, Jesus is the son. The law came from his father. That's God's words. Okay. So he, there's a relationship there, and he de he's telling them that I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what my dad said. Okay. You know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expound upon it and show you how to, how to complete it or how, to, how it will be completed. But there was a prophecy from the, the prophets and the law a foretelling of what all that Jesus came to do. Okay. Yeah, I think one key point is that Jesus is, is going to make this point throughout the sermon that the law is not something that was bad and needed to be abolished from the beginning. The law had its purpose, and I'm not coming to destroy it. What God did and gave us had a purpose, and I'm not coming to get rid of that or destroy it. I'm coming to fulfill it or accomplish it. Phil, well, do we have somebody back there? Uh, Brian has one. Brian first. Right. Sorry, Phil. Yeah, well, it's like you said in, before the Lord's Supper, you know, the Pharisees were the Harvard, the Harvard grads, you know, and they're the ones that know the law. And so if Jesus is opposing them, well, then there might be the temptation to think, well, Jesus is opposing the law. And I think there's, yeah. honestly, I think this is very challenging, you know, for us as well. It's kind of a general principle that if you believe in some... You're following a tradition that is not really God's law, and then somebody challenges that temptation is to think, well, that person's against God's law. He, he's lawless. And it's like, no, he's it's against your tradition. So we have to be careful with that distinction. Yeah, so 
the Pharisees were like the keepers of the law, right? They were the most studied. And all times he lumps the scribes and the Pharisees together in his rebukes. So it was not unusual for people of the time to get those two things confused. So in other words, if the Pharisees say it, then that must be God's law. And so Jesus is going to deal a lot with that kind of stuff. All through this sermon, he's going to make the distinction between what God says and what the Pharisees are teaching you. And so he, as he's starting this sermon, he goes, those aren't the same thing. And so I think that's an important part of it. Phil? Uh, yeah, I believe that the issue with his audience that he was trying to address was two things. Number one, they had misused the law and tried to turn it into a justifying mechanism to justify themselves before God. So they really didn't need to come to Christ. Um, and Paul takes care of that argument in Romans 8 when he says they sought to establish their own righteousness, but they wouldn't receive his. But the other issue was the, the law was a remedial system put into place because the people were not ready to receive the Messiah yet. It would take many years for that to happen. But because they didn't use it in that way, they used it in a corrupt way, they were not able to come to Christ like he wanted them to. And he was going to try to correct their misunderstandings of their interpretation of how to use the law. Um, instead of justifying themselves, they were, he was going to use it to bring them to him. Yeah. All right, good. Anybody else on that one? I have one other thing in this is... Jesus is going to be accused and has already, before he delivers this sermon, of being a lawbreaker, right? So Jesus is going to have to set, set the story straight here at the very beginning. I am not a lawbreaker. I am actually the fulfiller of the law. So let's look at a couple passages that deal with this. One is Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, which I alluded to in the Lord's Supper, right? Mark 2, 23 through 28 says this. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and how he also gave uh, those who were with him and he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So this contention that the Jews are going to continue to throw at Jesus, Jesus needed to address it right here at this particular occasion. Look, I am not breaking the law. I'm not destroying the law. I am fulfilling the law. Because his disciples were going to have to face this over and over and over again. In Luke chapter, or John chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son could do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, for whatever the, he does, the Son also does in the same manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one that has committed all judgment to the Son. So you go back to this, he, this is my Father, but this, this key, what are they going to be accusing Jesus of? You're breaking the Sabbath. You're not keeping the law. So Jesus is dealing with that. No, I'm not breaking the Sabbath. I am fulfilling the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, the one who is fulfilling the, fulfilling the law is much greater than the law itself. It goes on in a couple more passages. Let's just read these real quick. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Do not think I came to abolish the law. I just... Uh, or the prophets. This is the, on the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to notice the difference here. And the New King James, which is the second one on the screen here, is where I read, and it says fulfill both times, where the proper reading probably is. It's a different Greek word for fulfill and accomplish. So the question there then, and uh, the first part of the question that I ask in question number one is, what was Jesus' relationship to the law? We've talked about why he felt he needed to address it. 
But what was his true relationship to the law? Fulfiller of it, right? That's what he says specifically. Think about this for a second. Uh, what an incredible, amazing thing that would have been if they could grasp that. That Jesus came to accomplish everything that was in the law. And those who hung on to that and realized that would have had a totally different view of Jesus than, hey, he's coming to break the law or he's coming to reestablish something different. Uh, going along with that, when you look at Hebrews, especially 7 through 10, 7 through 9, um, you can almost say that, that he, the, sha- the law is the shadow of him, right? The sacrificial system, that's all him, right? The, the temple is his church, right? It, it's his body. Everything that's in that law uh, is, is a shadow of him, himself, of what he's going to do and back to the fulfill. Right. Could you imagine if you really could grasp that Jesus is really coming to illuminate everything. If we understand who this man is and what he is coming to do, we will understand the law better than we have ever understood it ever. Uh, One commentator wrote, Jesus came to fulfill all the types of the law and all the unfulfilled predictions of the prophets. Jesus and his kingdom with all that pertains to them constitute the object and fulfillment of all the prophets. So in other words, you mean we're, we're, in the, we're in the alive at the time where all the prophecies are ultimately going to be fulfilled through this one individual? How much more would this Jesus have meant to them if they realized this? In his book, Brother Earnhardt states it this way, Jesus was destined to be the fulfillment of all the Old Testament types and shadows and the realization of all the Old Testament prophecies. He was to be the culmination of the law's purpose to lead men to justification through faith in him. So this is a key, key element. I mean, if you don't, if, if you don't get this, Jesus' relationship to the law, you're not going to get anything else. Uh, and so he, he has to address this. A couple passages that we can look at here. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22 that the scripture was confined, has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So it's like you were just, the law... It was from God, right? And so Jesus isn't saying the law, God, God made a mistake, never should have given the law. The law was there for a reason. It was a tutor to get your minds ready and to give you all the information you needed so when Christ does come into the world, you'll recognize him and you'll recognize what he's here to do. He's here to offer everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, the opportunity to be justified by faith in Christ. That was the whole purpose of the Old Testament and the law and the, and, the, and the whole relationship he had with the Jews. It wasn't just a Jewish thing. It wasn't just a law-keeping thing. It was about telling them how God really intended to bring everybody back in fellowship with him, and that was through Jesus. So if you, it, was, it would be one of those moments that if you really got what Jesus said on this particular occasion, it would be one of those illuminating moments where you're like, wow, this is where I am is totally amazing. The fact that I can listen to him teach every day and follow him around, I am one of the most blessed people in the entire world. I'm going to hang on every single word he has to say and find out how all this stuff takes place. Randy? Yeah, I'm just sitting here trying to put all this into words that I can comprehend. Uh, <clears throat> kind of like Debbie was saying, and you just said, as John told us, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was God. So that relationship is so important for them to understand that he really can do this. He is the one who can make this happen, can fulfill this law, because he's God's son. And it's all about establishing that relationship there. Yeah, and, and he is going to say things that are going to look to the untrained eye, the, the, the Pharisee-trained eye, that he's breaking the law. And he's saying, no, 
I'm not a breaker of the law, I'm a fulfiller of the law. And I, they, I think that is just so important here. Before Brian gives his point, let's read Romans chapter 10, 1 through 4. It says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For, and this is sort of like he's talking about the people that were following Jesus, not following Jesus, the ones that were alive and were rejecting him. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And could you imagine when Paul understood that for the first time as being a Pharisee? And being somebody who was trained under Gamaliel, when he understood that everything that I had learned my entire life is now I understand it in a totally different degree and a lot better the way that it was supposed to be understood. And now he says, I want all of you who I used to be like, I used to think like you think, oh, understand how much better it is to understand the truth and know how, what God really intended from the law was to always bring us to Christ who could actually take care of the law. And I imagine there might have been some kicking yourself if you're Paul that you didn't follow Jesus and take advantage of all those opportunities or whatever, or the Pharisees of the day. Brian? Yeah. A couple of other things about the relationship. I mean, he's the giver of the law. Right? So he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And you're trying to tell me that I'm breaking my own law that I created as kind of absurd when you think about it. Um, but then secondly, in Romans 8, 4, it says that the re he came so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So it's like he came as our representative in our place to not only fulfill the requirement of the law in terms of keeping it perfectly, he actually showed us how to actually keep this law perfectly so that it's fulfilled in that sense. But then the other requirement of the law is that those who don't keep it perfectly will die and he paid that death for us. So it's just so rich, this, this concept of Jesus' relationship you know, to the law. And now we can go free because he, as our representative, met the requirement of the law because we couldn't. Yeah, and he paid the price uh, for all, all of us. So yeah, it's one of those things that it probably went over a lot of their heads. And it, it, it wasn't a while. And the, the true, true, true depth of it might go over our, de, uh, our heads, too as we read through it over and over and over again and just stop to think, man, what was he really saying here? What was he really doing? He was just really putting himself up as the only authoritative figure here. And that was gonna come in handy and that he was the keeper of the law, he was the fulfiller of the law, he was the giver of the law, he was the payer of the price for not breaking the law so that all of us could have faith in him. And he says, look, you have to keep this in mind. As we go through the rest of his ministry and his death, that anything I do has to be sort of judged through this lens now. If you understand this, you're going to be able to understand how I interact with the Pharisees. You're going to be able to understand what I say to the Pharisees. You're going to really get a lot more out of, out of my life if you really, really understand this. So he did not, in, in all of this, Jesus, so when Jesus said something, you could automatically know he's not telling you to break the law, Right? Because he says, not one jot or one tittle. We might say, not, you know, every T has to be crossed and every I has to be dotted of the law in the fulfillment of, of what I'm doing. So it, it, he's in, in, if you teach to break the law, at least in the kingdom of heaven, if you keep the law and tell others to keep the law, great in the kingdom of heaven. So while he was alive, he was telling the Jews of the time to keep the law. And he was fulfilling the law. So if my, if my disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath, they're not breaking the law if, I, if I'm giving them a chance to, to do that. All right, Phil has a, a comment here. What we're talking about is so rich uh, of how we see Jesus or how we don't see Jesus. You know, the Old Testament people saw Jesus on a mountain giving the law to Moses. But many years later, Jesus comes in the flesh and he comes up on the mountain and he proclaims this sermon to his people. The fulfillment of everything that was given to Moses years before. One of the struggles that I think we all have is with the law and with Jesus is we, I see Jesus as a sum total of not just the law and its fulfillment, 
that he is the, the culmination of everything where God wanted us to be that we couldn't be before. A lot of us, when we get baptized, I'm afraid, we, we get baptized, we hear the law, we hear the, the gospel call, we obey it, but it doesn't come to the place that it should come to for a lot of us. I remember being baptized and wondering, is that all there is? I knew there was more. There was Jesus. And this, this idea of joining with Jesus and uniting with him in baptism was, um, wasn't just a command that I obeyed because the gospel message said to do it. It was entering into a divine Godhead relationship, just as they did on the mountain with Moses, and just as Jesus is laying it out here. And I think that's, that's why the relationship, not just to the law, but to the Godhead, means so much to me. It gives me the answers that I can't find through the law alone. Jesus fulfilled not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, the heart of God behind it. And that's what he's proclaiming here with his mercy and his, all of his other divine mm -hmm. attributes. And that's what he's going to be showing every day of his life. And that's why one of the reasons we talked about when he left the mountain done teaching this, the people were like, he taught us what having authority not to describe. There's something different about him. And one of the things we talked about being different is that he lived it perfectly. He was teaching us something that was more challenging than we could ever live up to, more challenging than the Pharisees could ever live up to, which is going to address that. But he, he never failed to live it, never failed to live it perfectly. And like you said, not just the law itself, but uh, actually everything behind the law, the spirit of the law, everything God intended for the law to be, Jesus kept it perfect. So it wasn't like the Pharisees, look, I did this, I kept that law just the way I was supposed to keep it. You know, Jesus was keeping the law, but he was keeping it with the right spirit, the right attitude, and exactly how it was supposed to be kept, which had to be just eye-opening every day. I mean, could you imagine following Jesus around as one of his apostles every single day and seeing all this stuff unfold? Because we talked about this. They were, they were not educated in a worldly way that you might think they were, but spiritually they were educated. All the, all the Jews, you know, that we talked about, all the Jewish kids had to learn the Torah, right? They had to be able to quote just about all of it. So they knew all this stuff, and they had been taught it all their lives, and now they were realizing with Jesus, I hadn't really learned it right. And that is scary and challenging at the same time. I think all of us probably have had something in Scripture that we've looked at and said, I don't know that I've understood this correctly, and I don't know that I've been living this correctly. And it's really eye-opening when you do understand it. So question number two then, in what ways does our righteousness need to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? I think this is one of the key parts of the whole sermon that Jesus has given. In what ways does our righteousness need to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? All right, we have Randy up here. And Spencer's next. Go ahead, Randy. Well, yeah, the, the, the problem is that the Pharisees had externalized everything and Jesus was teaching them that it needs to come from the heart. You need to think this way. You need to just, it's a, a, a humble approach to God rather than a judging approach or a condescending approach. Well, I'm glad I'm not like this publican uh, kind of attitude. So he wanted them, uh, it, it, we have to, it has to be a, a realization that we have received a mercy, that we appreciate that to do everything we can to, to be a godly person. And that's way away from the Pharisees. And they also wanted to keep it from people. You know, the vast majority of the people until very recent times were illiterate. They were uneducated. Education was private. It was expensive. And so uh, that's another reason that uh, it was so important that people realized Jesus was the word and they could learn from that word and not depend on the Pharisees who were actually giving them uh, a wrong version of God's word. Yeah. And so. Yeah, and the Pharisees were more concerned, and he's going to talk about this a lot in this sermon itself, and then a lot of his other teaching. The Pharisees were more concerned about looking like they were keeping the law and being seen by other people and maybe doing technically the right thing, but their heart wasn't right, right? They weren't doing it for the right reason, the right motivation. 
And so the thought is, if that's the way that you view it, the way the Pharisees are, and that's the way that you live, you'll not be in the kingdom of heaven. There's no way. That is earth-shaking. That should be earth-shaking to all of us to understand what God expects for us. He, like, I, like I said in the Lord's Supper talk, we can't keep the law without showing mercy. You can think you're the biggest law keeper in the world, but without mercy, you're not keeping the law. Without faith, you're not keeping the law. Without justice, you're not keeping the law. So there's all that element. We want to do it from our heart. We want to do it to please a God who gave us mercy, not just to check off something that we did this and we did this and we did this. And, and that's to the point I was going to bring up, which is there was a disconnect between the heart and the mind. Back in Matthew 23, 23, he says, You tithe and mint and anise and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done. And then we stop, right? Those are the ones we're supposed to have been doing. He said, no, 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 without leaving the others undone. Right. And whenever we separate our mind and our hearts and we go to either side to just love and just mercy, just emotionalism, we're going to fail because we're not going to keep the law, be obedient. If we slide all the way over to just obedience but we don't have love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, we've also failed. So there, based on your comments in those lessons, there's five heart attitudes, at least, that have to be in place or it negates all of your faithfulness. And those are love, 1 Corinthians 13, right? Uh, Mercy, justice, and faith, Matthew 23, 23. Right? And what was the other one? Uh, forgiveness at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Or towards the end. Uh, Matthew 6, 14, forgiveness. Those five attitudes of the heart have to be in place or it negates all of your obedience. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever we separate our heart and our mind, we get in trouble. We have to put them together. Yep, good point. All right, Bonnie. The first thing that I kind of think of, thought about on this was that we have to follow all of Jesus' commands and not take away from it or add to it like it says he tells us in Revelation 22, 18, and 19. And the Pharisees, when they were making up all their rules, were really adding to or taking away from what God had told them in the beginning. Yeah. But they were doing it for all the right reasons, right? They were doing it to keep everybody from breaking the law. They wanted to put a cushion around the law so that you couldn't violate the law. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that... And, and he's going to talk about this in this sermon about keeping the law. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he does the will of my Father in heaven. And so we know that keeping the law is very important, doing what God wants out of the right heart and the right motive and the right attitude is what you really want. Brian? Yeah, and I think a huge key here is the source of our righteousness. Where does our righteousness come from? And Jesus, the very first, that's why I love the very first thing he said is, blessed are the poor in spirit, because he's saying... The only way you're going to understand any of this is if you know your righteousness doesn't come from you. It comes from God, his compassion, his mercy. That's the big difference with the Pharisees. They thought their righteousness came from themselves, and that's what gave them that air of moral superiority and all that. Yeah, and Jesus is going to deal with that in this sermon later on, right? right. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All right, we've got several other people here. Phil? Um, Paul says in Galatians 3 that the fulfillment of the law is love your neighbor. So... Doing righteousness and practicing righteousness goes back to the, the sum total of the law, to love God and love your neighbor. And that's the essence. And I, um, 1 Corinthians 13 passage, the reason I like that, it says it's the more excellent way to deal with problems, to deal with sin, to deal with our shortfall is his love and how it looks when you try to practice it and demonstrate it to somebody in the family. All right, All right. very good. And then Angie up here, go ahead. There, one of the things Jesus showed that the Pharisees lacked was an awe and a respect and a fear of the lawgiver, that being God. And there was no presumption to change anything that God had said or to improve upon anything that God had said or modify it to make it more acceptable. This is the word of God. And how dare we try to change that or lessen it or dilute it. And that's what he was dealing with in that day. Yeah, all right. So, and I have somewhere in here, the Pharisees almost idolized the law itself and worshiped the law itself instead of the lawgiver and realized that, hey, uh, as long as I'm keeping the law, that this is my real God here is the, the keeping of the law. 
And without the spirit behind it, without the law giver behind it, and that was a huge mistake they were making. And I think you have to see, Jesus wants us to see ourselves correctly, and the Pharisees never saw themselves correctly, right? That's the difference. It wants us to see that our righteousness is nothing. It's filthy rags. We want to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and that it has to be given to us by Jesus. Angie? Well, I just wanted to say I looked up the Torah, and according to Google, it has 640 pages as opposed to, you know, these 10 or 11 verses. And people are like, yeah, I can do this. But to try to, and I see the scribes and Pharisees as very crafty, like to, if someone does wrong, they can go right here and go, look, you didn't keep this correctly, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at those, you know, 10 verses, they were like, yeah, I can do this. And I realize that Torah is the first, you know, the books of Moses, but this is like in a nutshell. Yes, and that is one of the great things about the sermon, right? Is that if you ever want to know what you need to do to please God, yes, you could read the whole Bible from beginning to end, but if you really want the essence of it, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, and I just keep coming. That's why I say, read this every single week for the entire quarter and try to put this in our lives. Because if, if we practice what Jesus is actually teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, just like he says, this is a summation of the law. If we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves, we're going to keep all the law. If we're keeping this with the right attitude and heart. So that's why, I mean, I do encourage people to try to put as much of this to memory. If those students could learn the first five books of the Old Testament, can't we learn three chapters? Three chapters, 13 minutes. That's all it takes us if you want to recite it, 13 to 18 minutes. And if you don't, can't memorize it, just... In, Put yourself in it every day, and eventually you'll know bits and pieces of all of it. You probably know more of it than you think right now. It's just putting it in order. It becomes the, the biggest challenge. All right, got to move on here. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That without a cause is not in the original text, just so you know. And at least in some, some versions of it. And whoever says to his brother, Raka or Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. a gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will not, by no means get out of there until you have paid your last. So this brings us to question number three. And question number three is, what does the phrase, you have heard that it was said to those of old, mean? He's going to use it a lot. We better figure out what it means, right? He's going to use it several times in this passage. So what does it mean? All right. Matt up here. Somebody else have an idea? Raise your hands and they get a microphone to you. This is that, like what Brian was talking about, the traditions. Okay. This is what's been handed. This is the, the norm that they were used to. And sometimes it was right and sometimes it wasn't. And so he's, he's separating okay. out. Yeah, very good. So and he's not saying this is what the law said and it's all wrong. Right? He's not saying that. He is saying, this is what your traditions are. And we're going to go about establishing why those traditions are wrong. Look at Mark chapter 7 with me real quick. Mark chapter 7. I don't think I have that up here. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. I think this really answers this question. Mark 7, 1 through 13. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him having come from Jerusalem, now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled hands, that is, with unwashed hands, they found guilt. Going back to why he had to say, you know, I am the fulfiller of the law, I understand the law, if you're going to tell my disciples they're doing something wrong, you're, you're messing with the wrong person here. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders." When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? 
but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Ouch. I mean, that is a hard and heavy rebuke, isn't it? To the, and, and it just brings it right down. And this is, as Matt said, this is what Jesus is dealing with. He's not dealing with, hey, the law's wrong. He's not dealing with any of that. He's saying, your interpretation, your traditions are all wrong, and you hold those above the traditions of God. That's why it is so important for us as Christians to know the difference between what God says and what we do. Now, what we do might be exactly like God said. And there might be some things we do that, you know, we need to do a little more examination on. Is that really what God expects us to do? Not knowing the difference, we're gonna, we'll, end up right, we'll end up right back here. So that's why we really have to be able to say, all right, what does the Bible say about this? Regardless of what was handed down from us from our fathers or our grandparents, what does the Bible actually say? All right, and, and not, not put a commandment of men or tradition of men even in the same ballpark is a command of God, let alone elevating a tradition over a direct command of God, where you can say, I'm following, can you imagine this? I am following a tradition of my fathers instead of following a command of God. Nobody would want to say that, right? <laughs> Nobody would want to do that either. So we really got to make sure that we know what we're doing here. Okay, anybody else want to tackle question number three? All right, let's go to number four then. Why is it important not to think or say bad things about our brethren? And this is another, another one, I think as Angie was sort of pointing out, you have this whole law here, and then you, you had the whole law, and then you had the interpretation of the law. Jesus just had this uncanny ability to break everything down to small. Like he's going to say, just be honest. Don't swear later. We're going to talk about that. Just be honest. And so there's a whole bunch of important things here. So what can we have? Question number four, why is it important not to think or say bad things about our brethren? Bonnie has one, at least. They're Christians, like we claim to be too, and they're loved by God. And we will be judged by what we think and what we say. And so we need to be very careful. Yeah. All right, so we're going to be... There, there are brothers and sisters, first and foremost. That They have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. They have been forgiven. They are God's children. And so when we start thinking bad... We have Emory up here. Thinking bad about someone or talking bad about someone, we're really thinking bad and talking bad about someone that God loves and has died for. Emory? So one of the, I, I guess, tenets of being a Christian or Christ-like is that we're, we should be trying to build up others, our brethren. And when we're saying bad things, we're not actually building them up. We're tearing them down. And we're, potentially, we might be elevating ourselves above our brother. Okay. So the idea, though, I think is that it's, we should be building up, which is lifting your brother up above you to help them up. And then you will be carried along with them because you're another brother and will help you up. 
Yeah, if you're thinking bad about them, that's impossible, right? And if you're talking bad about them, that's impossible to you. The whole Philippians passage about esteem others better than yourself. It's this love that we should have for one another. And there's just a very small step between thinking and saying to acting. And I think that's what the whole point is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so if we're thinking bad about our brother or we're talking bad about our brother, it's not going to be too long before we do something bad to our brother. Okay? It's just that's what. So that's why, why Jesus. So the Pharisees all through this, uh, I'm not I'm not mistreating them. I'm not doing anything bad technically to them, but yet they're not loving and they're not being kind. So Jesus knows you are just centimeters away from actually doing the bad things. And so let's take way steps back here and let's address it way back here in what we're thinking. And if we can address it while we're thinking, then the actions are going to be there. Sure. Well, simply, we're, none of us, no, no one is uh, without sin, so we have no right to assume or say anything about anyone else. So, you know, and, the, and furthermore, we have no idea what our brethren is going through at all, you know, to make those judgments or to make those make those comments or think those thoughts. Yeah, very good. So Jesus is going to talk a little bit about that in the sermon too, in Matthew chapter seven, about judging and the way that we judge, and that's how we are going to be judged as well. And they had the whole court system all messed up, and they say it's okay, you know, to you, you, you just as long as you don't murder your brother, you're fine. I mean, that's that's it. No murder, you're fine. You know, that's. And, and, and the, the whole study of the court system here and what he's saying is a very interesting study. You, you think that, first of all, there really wasn't latitude in their judgment, their city courts, if somebody committed murder. There was really only one reward for murder, and that was death, right? And that God, and that goes well beyond the law of Moses. The first time it's mentioned is after the flood. And even Cain himself, even though God didn't impose on Cain mur- getting killed for the murder he committed, even Cain himself said, if people find out what I did, they'll kill me. So there is even a sense that we talk about this moral sense of all, that most people understand certain things. And even Cain, who was debased in his thinking, understood that people, when they know that I killed my brother, are going to think that I deserve to die. And so, uh, and, I, and I, we talked about this as well. One of the things Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is, and he's so good at this, is he's taking us back to what God intended from the beginning when he created man in his own image. Regardless of law, God wanted this. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking you back to what God intended so that you could enjoy it for eternity and be part of the kingdom of heaven. And that's just huge to think about. So the Pharisees had it all whack. As long as I don't murder, I don't care. And he's going to keep that whole concept going. I think we have one more question here. What should we do if we know someone has something against us and why? How important is it? You leave your... You leave your altar you leave your gift at the altar and you go reconcile with your brother so don't bring your gift to me and try to worship me if you know your brother has something against you now there's if you've tried to reconcile it and your brother's not willing to reconcile with you there's not really a whole lot you can do about that right romans chapter 12 says as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men. Is it possible for you want to want peace with somebody and you've done everything God told you to do to have peace and that person not want peace with you? Unfortunately, we live in a, a broken world. Not everyone's uh, going to do what God says. That is possible. But you better make sure you made your effort because I expect that. Brian? Yeah, and some stuck. You know, they're the ones on me. You know, I'm not the one who did it. And we just hold on to that pride and eventually it may come out in God's heavenly court that actually we were the guilty ones. Humble yourself. Go ahead and make friends immediately. Just go do whatever you can to make things right. And God will be pleased. Yeah, good point. Anyone else? We have just 30 seconds or so. I had a lot more in my notes that we didn't get a chance to cover. Sorry. But that we had a good class. Thank you for all of your uh, participation. And I challenge you again, maybe if you haven't done it, read the whole thing before Wednesday. 
All right? And as Brian, was, Brian made that point, uh, it came back to me, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right? So how he started out very, you're, you're not going to go to your brother and try to make peace if you have too much pride. If you have too much pride, you're not going to try to do that. So that's what we've got to keep in mind.